Hi, everybody. Welcome back to this week's Reading Buddies. My name is Carolyn, and today we're going to read the next few chapters of Out of My Mind by Sharon Draper. So I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, so from last week, Dia left us off from right here. And um, I just want everyone to take a few seconds, a few moments, pause the video if you have to, to reflect on what happened last week. So for those who don't know, um, last week, Miss V, um, Melody reflected on her time with Miss V and how Miss V taught her about doing things like how to read, rearrange her communications board, and just overall was a very nurturing figure to her and more of a teacher than her other teachers were in the past. So today we're going to learn more about this character called Mrs. Billups. So we'll get right into it. The next year, it all unraveled. I know teachers are supposed to write notes to the next teacher in line. They know what to expect, but either Mrs. Tracy didn't do it or Mrs. Billups, our third grade teacher, didn't read them. Mrs. Billups started every morning with playing her favorite CD. I hated it. Old MacDonald had a farm, Twinkle Twinkle's Little Star, The Itsy Bitsy Spider, all sung by children who could not sing. The type of music grown-ups think is all kinds of cute, but it's awful. Mrs. Phillips put on at full volume every single morning, over and over and over. No wonder we were always in a bad mood. When she put the tin pan, on, tin pan band on, Mrs. Phillips went over the alphabet every single day with third graders. Now children, this is an A. How many of us can say A? Good. She smiled and said good, even if no one in the class responded. I wondered if she, she would be able to teach able-bodied third graders the same way. Probably not. The more I thought about it, the angrier I got. Now let's move on to B. This is a letter B. Let's all say B. Good. Again to silence. She didn't seem to care. I glanced with longing at the books and tape and the earphones, wish, which I had shoved into a corner. One day, I guess I had enough. Mrs. Phillips had expanded from saying the letters to making the sound of each one. Look, she said loudly, spitting a little as she did. But is the sound of letter B. Let's all say but together, children. Then Maria, who was always in a good mood, started throwing crayons. Willie began to babble, and I bellowed. I may not be able to make clear sounds, but I can make a lot of noise. I screamed because I hated stuff that was just plain stupid. I screeched because I couldn't talk or tell her shut up. And that made me cry because I'd never be able to tell anybody what I was really thinking. So I screamed and yelled and shrieked. I cried like a two-year-old. I would not stop. I would not stop. When my, when, then my tornado explosion took over. I flailed and jerked and basically spazzed out. I kicked so hard that my shoes popped out of the foot straps on my chair. That made me tilt to one side and I screamed even louder. Mrs. Billupson didn't know what to do. He tried to calm me down, but I didn't want to be calmed. Even the aides couldn't stop me. Jill and Maria started to cry. Even Ashley, dressed all in yellow that day, looked upset. Freddie spun his chair around in circles, glancing sideways at me fearfully. Carl hollered for lunch. Then he pooped in his pants again. The whole class was out of control, and I kept screeching. So, I want you guys to pause for a minute and start to think about what exactly happened in this, in this um, section that we just read. So, do you guys think that Melody and the class slices the lips? Um, why do you think they're acting this way? How do you think they feel um, about Mrs. Phillips treating them that differently from other third graders? And why do you think they feel this way? And feel free to pause the video, think about this for a couple of moments, tell it to your potted plant, write it down, draw a picture to think about what you're thinking, um, and come back and it. All right, welcome back everyone. Um, so in this section, we thought about what exactly these kids feel with Mrs. Billups treating them as stupid or not as smart as normal normal kids and so we can tell that uh, melody and her friends are they're not less capable than other kids 
and they feel like Mrs. Billups is wrong in treating them this way, and they feel like this is not something that they should be subject to. So you can see they feel very frustrated. We're going to move on to the next section now, and right here. So I want you guys to read um, the next two paragraphs from here to here, to here, like right this. End it quickly. So start at Mrs. Billups didn't know what to do, and end at less work quickly. All right. Pause the video if you have to. All right. We're going to start off here. Mrs. Billups didn't know what to do. She tried to calm me down, but I didn't want to be calmed. Even the aides couldn't stop me. Joel and Maria started to cry. Even Ashley dressed all in yellow that day and looked upset. Oh, it seems like you read the part already. My bad. Um, can I actually you pause and read from here to right here? She, she's got the whole class in an uproar. So start at the teacher and end at an uproar. All right, welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much for reading. And we're going to read this part now. The teacher called Mrs. Anthony, the principal, whose eyes got wide as she opened our door. She took one look at the situation and said tersely, call her mother. She could not have left more quickly. A moment later, the teacher had her mother on the telephone. Mrs. Brooks, this is Melody's teacher, Anastasia Billups. Can you come to school right away? Right away? I, need my, I knew my mother had to be worried. Was it sick, bleeding, dead? No, she's not ill. She's fine, we think. Mrs. Billups was saying her most professional sounding teacher voice. We just can't get her to stop screaming. She's got the whole class in an uproar. I could picture my mother on the other end of the line trying to figure out what was going on. Luckily, it was her day off. I knew she'd be there for a few minutes, so I gradually calmed down and finally shut up. The other kids quieted down as well, like somebody had clicked the off switch. Old MacDonald continued to play. My mother ride faster than I thought possible. When I saw her jeans and dirty sweatshirt, I realized she dropped everything and jumped in the car. She ran over to me and asked what was wrong. I took a few deep, shuddering breaths, and I pointed to the alphabet on my talking board and screeched some sounds of frustration. This is about the alphabet, my mother asked. Yes. I pointed and pounded on the answer. She turned to Mrs. Phillips. What were you working on before all the screaming started? Mrs. Billups replied in a superior tone the teachers dressed in nice red business suits used when talking to mothers with, mothers with dirty shirt, shirts on. We were re reviewing the alphabet, of course. The sound of the letter B, if I recall. I always start with the basics. These children need constant review because they don't retain information like the rest of us. So my mother was getting the picture. So you were going over the ABCs? Correct. It's February. I beg your pardon? School started in August. You haven't gone past letter B in six months. Mom was bawling and unbawling with this. I've never seen my mother hit anything, but when I see her doing that, I always wonder if she might. Who are you to tell me how to run my class? The teacher said angrily. And who are you to bore these children with mindless activities? My mother snapped back. How dare you? The teacher gasped. I dare anything for my daughter, Mom replied, her voice dangerous. And for the rest of these children, you don't understand, the teacher began. Mom interrupted her. No, Mrs. Phillips, it is you who does not understand. Mom looked like she was trying to calm herself down because she, didn't, she then said, Look, have you ever said to yourself, if they show that stupid commercial on TV one more time, I think I'll just scream? Mrs. Phillips uh, nodded slowly. Mom interrupted. Oh, right here. Or if I have to sit five more minutes in the traffic jam, I'll simply explode. Yes, I suppose, she admitted. Well, I think that's happened to Melody. She said to herself, if I have to go over these letters one more time, I'll just scream. So she did. I really don't blame her, do you? Mrs. Billups looked from my mother to me. I guess not. Nothing explained it to me that way. Mrs. Billups finally said, her voice now as calm as my mother's. Melody knows her alphabet, all the sounds of the alphabet, all the sounds of all the letters, and hundreds of words on sight. She can add and subtract numbers in her head. We discussed all this at our last parent conference, didn't we? I could tell my mother was trying to control her temper. I thought you were exaggerating, teacher said. Parents are not always realistic when it comes to these children. If you call them these children one more time, I might scream, my mother warned. But Melody does have mental and physical limitations. 
Mrs. Bill argued, trying to put mom in her place. I guess. You have to learn to accept that. But Melody does. Oh. And the fire was back. Melody can't walk. Melody can't talk, but she's extremely intelligent, and you better learn to accept that, Mom spat out. The teacher backed up an inch or two. Didn't you read her records from last year? Mom demanded. Melody loves listening, loves listening to books on tape. I try to approach each child with an open mind and not be influenced by other teachers. All the records are in a box in place. Maybe you should find that box, my mother said, her lips tight. Well, I never... Mrs. Phillips countered. Maybe that's your problem, Mom replied with a green grin. Then she tilted her head and turned towards the CD player. Oh, one more thing. May I see that wonderful CD you're playing? Of course, Mrs. Phillips said, smiling a little. The children love this. Do they? Mom asked. The teacher lifted this from the player. Twinkle, twinkle, silence. Lily sighed out loud. Mom took the CD, dug in her purse for a moment, gave Mrs. Phillips a $5 bill, and deftly snapped the disc in half. That music was cruel and unusual punishment. Freddie and Maria cheered. Gloria whispered, Keith? For a moment, I almost felt sorry for Mrs. Wilkes. She looked so confused. She just didn't get it. Mom walked over to the sink in our room, turned on the warm water, and soaked a sack of paper towels under the faucet. She came back to me and gently wiped my face with a warm, soggy rag. Nothing had ever felt so soothing. She then brushed my hair, adjusted the straps and buckles on our chair, gave me a quick hug, and went home. Mrs. Bill quit her job after spring break, so we ended up with a series of subs till the end of the year. I think she had figured out it would be easy for us to work with people who were dumber than she was. She was wrong. So, now that we finished that bit, um, I want us to take a moment to reflect on how Melody reacted to her mom and the rest of the kids reacted to her mom coming in and standing up for Melody and her friends against Mrs. Bill. So here you see how, um, well, actually, I'm going to give you guys some space to reflect on that. So how do you think Melody feels to have her mom coming here and defend her against Mrs. Billups? How do you think she feels when Mrs. Billups doesn't understand her? And how do you feel when her mom comes back and defends her and recognizes what she's really feeling? And let's try to answer in a complete sentence. And um, let's try to answer with at least um, at least one sentence. And not just one word. Awesome. Welcome back, you guys. Um, I hope you thought about that question a little bit. And I hope this helps you understand a little bit more about Melody as a character and what she's feeling, her friends are feeling. And we're going to move on to the next part. Thank you guys for staying with us so far. I really appreciate all the thought you're putting into this. And we're going to this part. For a long time, it was just me, my mom, and dad, and my goldfish, Ollie. I was five years old when I got him, and I had him for almost two years before he died. I guess it's too old for a goldfish. Nobody knew Ollie's name but me, but that's okay. Ollie had been a prize from a carnival dad had taken me to, and I think Ollie's life was worse than mine. He lived in a small bowl on the, on the table in my room. The bottom of the bowl was covered with tiny pink blocks, and a fake plastic wand sat wedged in the box. I guess it was supposed to be supposed to look like something from under the sea, but I don't think there are any lakes or oceans that really have rocks that color. Ollie spent all day swimming around that small bowl, ducking through the fake log, then swimming around again. He always swam in the same direction. The only time he changed course was when mom dropped a few grains of fish food into his bowl each morning and evening. I'd watch him gobble the food, then poop it out, then swim around and around again. I felt sorry for him. At least I got to outside and to a store and to school. All I just swam in a circle all day. I wondered if fish ever slept. But any time I woke up in the middle of the night, Ollie was still swimming, his little mouth opening and closing like he was trying to say something. One day when I was about seven, Ollie jumped out of his bowl. I, be, I had been listening to music on the radio. Mom had finally figured out I liked the country western station, and I was in a good mood. The music was sounding orangey and yellowish as I listened. 
and the faint whiff of lemon seemed to surround me. I felt real mellow as they watched all do the same thing round and round his bowl. But suddenly, for no reason I could figure, Ollie dove down to the bottom of his bowl, rushed to the top, and hurled himself right out of the bowl. He landed on the table. He gasped and flopped, and I'm sure he wasn't surprised. He was surprised he couldn't breathe. His eyes bulged, and the gills on his side pushed, pulsed with effort. I didn't know what to do. He died with that water really fast, so I screamed. Mom was downstairs, or maybe outside getting the mail, but she didn't come right away. I screamed again, louder. I cried out. I yelled. I screeched. Ollie continued to flop and gasp, looking more desperate. Ollie needed water. I howled once more, but Mom didn't come running. Where could she be? I knew I had to do something, so I reached over to the table and stretched out my arm. I could just barely touch Ollie's bowl. I figured if I could get the fish wet at least a little bit, I might be able to save him. I hooked my fingers on the edge of the fishbowl and I pulled. Water splashed everywhere, all over the table, the carpet, me and Ollie. He seemed to flop a little less for a second or two, and I kept wailing. Finally, I heard my mother thunder thundering up the stairs. When she came through the door, she took one look at the mess and the dying goldfish and shouted, Melody, what have you done? Why did you knock over the fishbowl? Didn't you know a fish can't live without water? Of course I knew that. I'm not stupid. Why did she think I'd been screeching and calling for her? She scurried over to the mess, scooped up Ollie, and gently placed him in the bowl. Then she ran to the bathroom, and I heard her running water, but I knew it was too late. Either because of the time on the bowl or because the bathroom water wasn't the right temperature, Ollie didn't survive. Mom came back and scolded me once more. Your goldfish shouldn't make it, Melody. I don't get it. Why would you do that to the poor little fish? He was happy in his little world. I wondered if maybe well, Ollie wasn't happy after all. Maybe he was sick and tired of that bowl and that log in that circle. Maybe he just couldn't take it anymore. I feel like that sometimes. There was no way I could explain to mom what had happened. I really had tried to save Ollie's life. I just looked away from mom. She was angry, and I was too. If she hadn't been so slow, she hadn't been so slow, Ollie might have made it. I didn't want to see her make me cry. She cleaned up the mess beside and left me with the music in an empty spot on the table. The colors had vanished. It was a long time before I was ready for another pet. While my eighth birthday, my father brought a big box into the house. He seemed to have trouble holding on to it. When he set it on the floor in front of me, he out exploded a flash of wriggling gold light. A puppy! A golden retriever puppy! I shrieked and kicked with joy. A puppy! The clumsy little dog raced around the room, sniffing in every corner. I watched her every move, loving her right away. After exploring every table leg and piece, piece of furniture, Puppy stopped, made sure all of us were watching, then squatted and peed right there on the carpet. Mom yelled, but only a little. That's when the dog knew she was in charge. She checked out dog, Dad's very toes, but she stayed away from Mom, who was trying to sew the spot of the rug with paper towels and that, and that spray stuff she likes to use in the kitchen. Finally, Puppy circled around my wheelchair and around like she was trying to figure it out. She sniffed it, sniffed my legs and feet, looked at me for a minute, then jumped right, a, right up onto my lap like she'd done a million times. I barely breathed, not wanting to disturb her. Then, wow, 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 she turned around three times and made herself comfortable. I think she made a noise like a sigh of satisfaction. I know I did. Um, I showed her soft back and head as gently as I could. I was the one who named her. Mom and Dad kept suggesting dumb names like Fuzzy and Coffee. But I knew as soon as I saw her what name her name should be. I pointed to the bowl on the table, which held my most favorite, favorite candies, butterscotch caramel. They're soft enough to melt my mouth so I don't have to chew, and oh, are they delicious. You want to call her candy? Dad asked. I shook my head no gently so the sleeping puppy wouldn't wake up. Caramel? Mom asked. I shook my head once more. Why don't we call her Stinky? Dad suggested with a grin. Mom and I just glared at him. I continued to point to the candy dish. Finally, Mom said, I know, you want to call her butterscotch? I wanted to shriek, but I forced myself to stay calm. I tried real hard not to do anything that would knock the puppy off my lap. Uh, I said softly as I continued to stroke the dog's silky fur. I didn't know that anything could be so soft, and she was all mine. It was the best birthday I ever had. Butterscotch sleeps at the foot of my, my bed every night. 
It's like she read the book on what a great dog ought to do. Bark only when a stranger is at the door, never peer poop in the house. She got over that puppy stuff and keep Melody happy. But a scratch doesn't care that I can talk to her. She knows I love her. She just gets it. One day, a few months after I got her, I fell out of my wheelchair. It happened. Mom had given me lunch, taken me to the toilet, and wheeled me back into my room. Butters got trotted behind, never in the way, just close by me all the time. Mom popped in a DVD for me and made sure my hands were properly positioned so I could rewind and fast forward the film. She didn't notice my seatbelt wasn't fastened, and neither did I. We traveled up and down the stairs doing several loads of laundry. I'm awfully messy, and I guess she had started fixing dinner. The rich aroma of simmering tomato sauce floated up the stairs. Mom knows I love spaghetti. She peeked her head and check on me and said, I'm going to lie down for a couple of minutes, Melody. Are you, go are you okay for a few? I nodded and pointed my arm towards the door to tell her to go ahead. My movie was getting good anyway. Butterscotch sat curled next to my chair. She outgrew my lap. The mom blew me a kiss and closed the door. I was watching something I'd seen a million times. The Wizard of Oz. I think most people in the world can quote sections of that movie. No extra brains required because it's one of the movies that gets played over and over again on cable channels. But I know every single word in it. I know what Dorothy said, will say before she even opens her mouth. I don't think we're in Kansas anymore, Toto. It makes me smile. I've never been to Kansas or Oz or anywhere more than a few miles away from home. Hmm. How do you guys think Melody feels um, when she says this line? I've never been to Kansas or Oz or anywhere more than a few miles from home. What do you think that implies about what she's thinking? Feel free to pause the video if you have to. Yeah. I can bet that um, if you guys have something along the lines of, I bet she feels trapped or she, um, she feels like she's powerless or she's, um, not able to take care of herself or anything along those lines, um, I think that you'd be right in the scenario. So she's watching a movie about a fantastical place, Oz, and she's thinking about how she can travel there. So it's just about how she's unable to do anything for herself, she feels like, right? It can be a very powerless feeling. Even though I knew it was coming, when the movie got to the part where the Tin Man does that stiff little dance to the music of If I Had Only Had a Heart, I cracked up. I laughed so hard, I jerked forward in my chair and found myself face down on the floor. But I got jumped up immediately, sniffing and making sure I wasn't hurt. I was fine, but I couldn't get back up in my chair. Worse, I was going to miss the part where the cowardly lion gets smacked on the nose by Dorothy. I wondered how long Mom's nap would last. I didn't scream like the time. All had jumped out of the bowl. I wasn't upset, just a little uncomfortable. I tried to flip over, but I couldn't from the position I had landed in. If I could have seen the television where I had fallen, I might have been okay on the floor for a little while. Butterscotch makes a great pillow. But Butterscotch went to the closed door and scratched. I could hear her claws ripping up the wood. Dad wouldn't be happy when he saw that, but Mom didn't come. So Butterscotch barked, first a couple of tentative yips, then louder and more urgent. Finally, she jumped up and threw her whole body against the door, making loud thuds. She barked and thud, barked and thud. Mom couldn't ignore all that racket. I'm sure it was only a few minutes, but it seemed like longer. Mom came to the door looking groggy. Her hair was all messed up. What's going on here? She began. Then she saw me. Oh, Melody, baby, are you okay? She ran to me, sat on the floor, and tilted me onto her lap. She chucked everything, my arms, my legs, my back, my face, my scalp, even my tongue. I wanted to tell her I was fine. All she needed to do was put me back in her, my chair where she had to do the thing, mom thing, and double check. But I got you good, good girl, she said as she, pet, she petted the dog and hugged me tight. Doubles on the dog food tonight. I'm sure Bella Scotch would have preferred a nice thick boat instead, but she can't talk either. So both my dog and I get what they give us. Mom carefully put me back in my chair and made sure that my seatbelt was latched correctly. Butterscotch crawled up right in front of me, making sure, I guess, that if I slid out again, she'd be there to soften the fall. That dog is amazing. Mom restarted the video from the beginning, but somehow the yellow brick road had lost some of its magic glow. 
nobody really wishes gets gets wishes granted by the great odds. I as I watched, I wonder if I was going to odds with my dog. What will we ask the wizard for? Hmm. Brains? I've got plenty. Courage? But it's going to scare them nothing. A heart? We've got lots of heart, me and my pup. So what would I ask for? I like to sing the cowardly lion and dance with the tin man. Neither one of them did those things very well, but that would be enough for me. All right. We're going to end off here today. Um, and we can continue on on this section when I was eight things changed next week. Um, I want to say thank you so much, you guys, for tuning in today. And um, make sure we think a little bit about the things that we discussed today, we read today. So here we have uh, Melody, and she just got new dog, Butterscotch. And she starts to think about how Butterscotch um, relates to her and how they have the same feelings about not being understood and how they feel like they're powerless and they only they only get what other people give them. And so she sees a lot of herself in Butterscotch and that helps make her a stronger relationship with her dog and helps give someone to relate to. So next week we're gonna start reading from this page and we'll see you then. All right, thank you so much for tuning in everyone and have a great rest of your day. Bye.